Hey, hello everyone and welcome to Executive Function and Goal Setting Webinar. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ross. Uh, I am the Media Manager here at Research ILD and for the SMARTS program. Um, I'm going to be giving you a little kind of technical intro uh, to get everybody situated and also while we wait for any stragglers to join the webinar. Um, so first off, hello everyone, um, you'll see to uh, the side of the screen we have a place for chat and a place for questions. And honestly, either one of those. Um, it'd be great if you said hi, tell us where you're from, tell us anything about you. Um, and also, I have to say that we always ask for people to ask us questions before a webinar begins. And you guys did amazing. These are the best and most questions we've ever gotten on a webinar. So kudos to you guys. Um, if I try to answer um, all of your questions, if you have any that uh, still need to be answered or ones that come up during the webinar, know that at the end of this webinar, we'll be doing a little sort of informal Q&A session, okay? Um, okay, other things to know. Uh, so uh, first off, um, so this is going to be run um, by our fabulous, the fabulous Michael Greshler, um, and it is meant to be run by also our colleague Kim Davis, who can't make it today. So Michael's on his own, but don't worry, you're in very good hands. Now, as for me, I will be standing by throughout the webinar um, to help with any technical things and to also answer any questions if uh, they come up during the webinar and Michael doesn't see them, that type of thing. So first off, technical things. Uh, now, 99.999% of the time, if you're having any problem with sound, um, with uh, the picture stuttering or anything like that, it can be solved by just refreshing the page. Um, so that's the first thing. So if something goes wrong, try that first. It, it doesn't really happen that often, but there's a lot of you on here, so it might. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then uh, you should chat, put a little chat with me in the chat. Okay, oh, I say, hello, Lucinda uh, from the Carroll School. Hello, Lauren. Um, uh, nice to see you guys here. Uh, so also, so again, if you have more problems, just say, hey, Elizabeth, and I'll try to fix it for you, okay? So put that in the chat there. Um, also, there will be a recording of this very webinar that you are free to watch whenever you like. Um, basically, it will be up a few hours after the webinar ends. So don't feel like you have to take in every little piece of information uh, right now. You can always go back and you can watch it. So uh, there's that. Okay, last few things. Um, there is a uh, there is a red full screen button above the screen where you see my face. So uh, we'll be basically sharing a PowerPoint in this per in this uh, webinar. So most of the time the PowerPoint will be front and center. But if you're having trouble, re oh hello Michael. Hi everybody. Given the intros. Um, Great. Uh, if you are having any trouble reading those PowerPoint slides, just hit that full screen button and that'll make it bigger and that should help. And then also uh, during the webinar, you can actually uh, click on either of our faces to make them bigger or click on the, click on the webinar to make that bigger. Uh, so I mostly, I think that's all the intro that we need. Michael, do you have any intro things? Uh, no, I mean, I'm excited to get started. We got a lot to cover, so uh, why don't we just take it away? All right. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Grushler. I am the director of the Smarts Executive Function Program. And basically, I'm going to walk you through some of the big topics that we have today. So let me get the PowerPoint loaded up. Um, so we are going to spend some time talking about executive function more broadly and then goal setting more specifically. Um, there is my, you know, very handsome picture. I made sure not to wear that shirt today, um, just to you know, show off my wardrobe. But um, so my name is Michael Greshler. I'm the director of the Smarts Executive Function Program, which we'll learn a little bit more about today. Uh, looking at our agenda for the day, I talked. We're going to talk about executive function. We'll talk about can-do goals. And you know, when we were getting ready to do this webinar, and people started signing up, um, they all they started asking a lot of questions about motivation. They said, well, what do you do for kids who say they have no goals? Or what do you do for kids who say they just don't uh, care? And, you know, it was really interesting because at first I was like, but that's, I want to talk about goal setting. And then I was thinking, you know what? It makes a lot of sense that people who are looking for strategy for goal setting also want to talk about motivation a little bit. So we're going to spend some time talking about 
um, how to kind of use what we know about motivation to help students engage more with goal setting and to get in touch with their own motivation. And then maybe we'll have time for questions if I can keep myself uh, going. Now, I also will say that I have been told I talk very quickly. So just kind of type in the bar down below if you're having trouble keeping up with me, okay? And I'll slow myself down. We talk very fast on the East Coast. Uh, so Research ILD, this is the organization I work for, um, the Research Institute for Learning and Development. It's out here in Lexington, Massachusetts, where it's already kind of dark and a little chilly. Um, we're an organization, we're a nonprofit that does a lot of work around executive function, strategies for helping students develop uh, self-awareness, strategies for motivating students and engaging them in the learning process. We do a number of conferences and workshops throughout the year. Uh, we have publications and books uh, around the work of our president, Dr. Lynn Meltzer, and then we have the SMARTS program, which you'll learn about. Uh, one thing that's unique about us is that we have a sister organization called ILD, the Institute for Learning and Development. And ILD is a learning center that does neuropsych evaluations and educational services. So we use a lot of the theories and strategies and things like that here as kind of an incubator before we share things out with the world. Um, I think that's a pretty unique organization that I'm proud to be a part of. And then you've you heard it once or twice, uh, SMART. SMARTS is the executive function curriculum where a lot of the materials we're gonna look at today come from. Um, this is our website, smarts-ef.org. I hope that you will explore it when you have a chance. You can find a lot of great resources like blog posts, um, videos with Elizabeth, our you know, video maven all over the place. And then you can find more about if, you, if the curriculum itself is of something of interest to you, you can check that out. There's a preview lesson, fun stuff like that. Um, I think I mostly covered this, but I do want to make kind of one point about it. When we talk about executive function curriculum, it's also a uh, motivation curriculum. It's also a self-awareness curriculum. Because as we move into the kind of what is executive function phase, we're going to see that all of those things are always interwoven. So we're here to talk about executive function and all of the constructs that go along with it. So this is the paradigm of executive function that Dr. Meltzer has created and that guides our work. So you see that we talk about executive function as a combination of uh, five key processes that are crucial for lifelong learning. Uh, and you'll notice that if you know about executive function, you'll notice that these are different than other people's, than say Tom Brown, Russell Barkley, Phil Zalazzo. They all have kind of different breakdowns of the executive function processes. I will say that I like ours because all of these are very concrete, right? So each one of these, you can kind of see the role that it plays in successful learning. So let's take a look. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is cognitive flexibility. So cognitive flexibility is the ability to shift approaches easily, the ability to think flexibly one way, shift to another way. Um, you see it in really young kids when we do really silly things like uh, a riddle or you know those Amelia Bedelia stories, asking kids to think about language in multiple ways. But cognitive flexibility underlies a lot of other things too. Think about when you teach a kid how to do a math problem and then they need to do the math problem a different way on the test and they're like, I never learned that. Or when kids are used to a very rigid uh, schedule and one thing changes the schedule and they have a lot of trouble coping. So cognitive flexibility is kind of a gateway into executive function in that it allows you to adopt strategies to handle whatever life is throwing at you. Goal setting, which I know that we're all interested in because we're here today, uh, goal setting is at the heart of executive function because executive function is kind of turned on when you have a goal. When you say, okay, I want to get an A on this test or okay, I want to you know, lose five pounds. When you have a goal in mind and you break down the steps, that is executive function. So we talk about short-term goals and long-term goals, which we'll get into a lot more, but we want students to be able to set realistic goals with plans behind them. And that's what successful goal setting looks like um, when engaging executive function. Organizing and prioritizing are two very uh, obvious areas of executive function. I see, you know, see that uh, exploding backpack over there. That's something that brings a lot of people to us. 
when they're looking for executive function work. They're like, wow, my kids are a mess. You know, the hallmark of that is if they do their homework and they don't turn it in because they lost it, which I can't, oh, so sad. That's so sad when we see that. So we want students to be able to understand the structure of organization. How are things organized? What is the system for it? What is the point of it? And it's not just organizing materials either. Um, we put time management under organizing because it requires you to estimate and organize the different things you have to do to get them all done. Um, we also put things like organizing information. So you think about um, organizing an outline for an essay or organizing your notes so that you have main ideas, supporting details, and discard the irrelevant information. So organizing and prioritizing is actually kind of a multifaceted area of executive function that's crucial for successful learning. Accessing working memory. So working memory, I like to think of as the brain's kind of whiteboard. Um, what, are, what are the pieces of information I need to be able to juggle to accomplish whatever task I'm being asked to do at that time? Uh, so we think about, you know, if you're, if you're reading directions for a test, you need to be able to hold the directions in your mind and pull up the long-term memory that tells you how to do the problem and then kind of use your uh, language centers to write it out. And the working memory is going to coordinate all those different pieces and parts. Um, students who have a weak working memory can get really overwhelmed very easily. If you think about uh, internet, like maybe we all remember dial-up internet. I don't know. I don't know how old we all are, but I remember dial-up internet. And, you know, it was very easy to overwhelm that. If the web page is too much or if you have too many tabs open, things are going to kind of start freezing and going very slowly. And that's what can happen when we overwhelm our students' executive function uh, abilities. And finally, we have self-monitoring and self-checking, which we actually split into two different um, constructs, I guess you'd say. So self-monitoring is ongoing monitoring. It's reflecting while you're doing something. Am I on task right now? Like for me on this presentation, I need to say, am I on task? Am I on time? Am I speaking slowly enough? Am I giving enough examples to make it relevant, right? Um, for students who are working in groups, self-monitoring is very important. For students who are working independently and may be you know, spending a lot more time procrastinating than they realize, self-monitoring is very important. Self-checking, on the other hand, is when you go back after you've done something and see if you did all the things you said you would do, right? So classic, I mean, you ask a student, did you check your work? And they say, yeah, of course I checked my work. But when you look at it, you can see a lot of mistakes. Students need to be taught to check things on multiple levels. You know, thank goodness for spell check. It's a wonderful thing. And Grammarly and things like that are taking spell check to a whole new level. But we also have to help them check uh, their sources? Are they using factual sources? Are they using st good structure? Is the style up to snuff, right? So we have to help students check on multiple levels, uh, whether it's a paper or a test or anything that they might be turning in. And underneath all of these things is metacognition. You cannot possibly be teaching executive function if you aren't getting students to reflect on the process. Because if a student walks into my room and I give them and I say, today you're going to clean out your backpack by doing X, Y, and Z, and they do X, Y, and Z, and they don't think about it ever, that's not executive function. That's just doing what you're told. So in order to get students to really engage with executive function, we have to help them understand how they learn, understand how they think, and develop a picture of who they are, what are they good at, and what is hard for them. A few important points to make. The reason you teach executive function strategies is not because your kids are bad at it. A lot of people come to us looking for help for students who are struggling with executive function, and those struggles are real. But the reason we're teaching it is not because, oh, you're so bad at this stuff. The reason we're teaching that is executive function is at the core of being a successful and fancy adult, right? Uh, I know that we all have our planners somewhere within uh, reaching distance. I know that we all have our systems for juggling the things our jobs throw at us, for checking our emails before we send them. But a lot of those systems are hidden from our kids. So when you're teaching executive function, I really encourage you to make your executive function strategies as um, apparent as possible, as visible as possible, so that students can see this is not one of those topics where they say, I'm never going to use this stuff you're gonna to prove to them that executive function is at the heart of being a successful adult, and that is why we're going to engage with it. 
Um, and many students do struggle with executive function. Don't get me wrong. I see them a lot in my own work, and I see them a lot in the schools we go out and work with for smarts. So why? Why are they struggling so much? Um, one thing is that, you know, there's a lot of things we ask them to do. Things like test preparation, note taking, paying attention um, can grow. All of a sudden, now they've got and homework, and they have to do a reading project, and they've got a long-term project, and they're struggling with essay organization. When the demands that we are asking students to do exceed their abilities, they're going to start to feel overwhelmed. We also live in a time where technology is changing the way that we develop our executive functions. I always like to mention, um, you remember going to the library when you had to look something up? Think about all those steps that it used to take. I used to have to go in there, find the index to the library, look up the uh, subject I was looking for, find it in the book, find that in the card catalog, uh, then go take the card and find it in the thing. So each one of those is an opportunity to be developing the strategies that executive function consists of. But now, hmm, what do I have to do if I want to look up you know, the GDP of Madagascar? Well, it's right here. I could be like, hey, Siri, what is the GDP? So it has also limited some opportunities for development of executive function. Also, the ability to get on Facebook in two seconds or Snapchat or whatever kids are doing may also be interfering with that. Um, so the end result is when you have students who have really high demands placed on them and they're kind of in this 21st century world with more distractions than ever before, the students are overwhelmed. Um, they're smart, but they're stuck. They are not able to show what they know. So this is Dr. Meltzer's favorite paradigm of executive function uh, weakness or struggle, this idea of a clogged funnel. All the stuff is there, they have the books, they have the assignments, they have the know-how, and nothing is coming out. And when a student struggles to produce, it's very likely that there is an executive function explanation behind it. A few more points. Um, we're all brought to executive function for different reasons. I think we know that there's biological components, we know there's developmental components, right? Uh, kids with ADHD have a neurobiological reason that executive function might be harder for them. Boys are a little bit behind girls, you know. Developmentally, uh, we see the development of executive function gets better with age, right? We're seeing that, you know, when you're 26, 27 year old, you're coming into those adult powers, but as you get there, there's definitely a, a a learning trajectory. But I wanted to show this slide to you because you can't control your kid's biology, you can't control their developmental age, but you can control the context. The development of executive function does not happen in a vacuum. It happens in the kid's day-to-day -day lives, and that's the area where we can intervene. Sometimes when we go into schools, we play this game with the uh, zone of proximal development. You can't actually see all the text on it. The middle one is can't do yet. The next one is can do a support. And the last one is can do independently. Um, if we think about all the different tasks we're asking our students to do, and if we put them on that chart and think about what they should be able to do and what they are able to do, there might be a gap there. And in that gap is where executive function difficulties um, arise. You know, if we're saying to our kids, you need to be able to uh, write a three-page paper, and there are students who don't understand how to organize main ideas and details into a coherent outline, then those kids are not going to be able to write that paper, even though they might have a lot to say on the French Revolution, or whatever the topic is. So the secret is to uh, teach the strategy. So whatever the demand is in the classroom, you're going to teach a strategy to match it. And if you do that, you have a lot of opportunity to develop executive function in whatever class you're dealing with, whether it's math or science or English or study skills or even just a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. If you can help model a strategy that helps the student meet the demands that are placed on them, they're going to be building their executive function abilities and they're going to be overcoming areas of executive function weakness. Um, I always like just showing this slide and we'll be talking about it more later, but Strategies, metacognition, self-concept, and motivation, all those things are related. If you think about a student who is struggling, uh, let's say they're failing their math class, you know, they, they're going to say things like, oh, I suck at math, or oh, I'm so bad at this stuff. Uh, I guess I can't do it. I don't want to try. I hate the teacher. I hate the homework, right? None of that is very metacognitive. They aren't really speaking to what they're actually good at and what's actually hard for them. Their self-concept is in the garbage and their motivation and effort suffer as a result. 
if you can help students use strategies to do better in that class, they're going to start telling you, oh, I don't like that strategy, but I do like this one. Um, oh, you know, I'm getting a B minus in this. I told you I was good at this. I know I can do it. And the motivation and effort will improve. So teaching those explicit strategies is about more than just building executive function. It's kind of initiating that positive uh, cycle of growth and change. When we talk about strategies, it's very important to remember, strategies must be taught explicitly. Uh, you know, especially for students who struggle, you can't just assume they're going to absorb it from the ether. If I need my students to be able to clean out their backpack, at some point I need to teach them how backpacks are cleaned out and organized explicitly. Why should we assume that's the case? There's a lot of danger in that assumption that students will learn it without our help, especially around organization. And we're gonna talk about goal setting, but think about organization for a second. We go into schools and we ask the kids, oh, who likes organizing? And what do they all say? Oh, boo, I hate to organize, organizing stinks. And why do they say that? The only time they hear about organization is when they're getting in trouble. We're saying, wow, your room's a mess. Wow, you need to clean this up. This is gross. They've never actually been taught that organization is a tool that you can use to make your life easier. So that's what I mean by those explicit strategies. I'm gonna teach my kids a strategy to organize their backpack. I'm gonna play a game with it to make it fun. I'm going to praise the system they come up with and I'm gonna ask them, did you find that useful? Did you like that? And that's an opportunity for them to see um, how organization can make their life easier and kind of put their own spin on it. So that kind of concludes our um, overview of executive function. Now I wanna get into the goal setting piece explicitly. So let's talk about how I can actually use strategies to set goals that work for them. So when I have my students, I ask them, what are your goals? You know, what goals do you have? And there's three types of goals that I'm used to seeing. So I want you to think to yourself, what do you think those three top goals are? Um, so just, you know, I'm not gonna pause and let you guys actually type it in because I have so much to cover, but think about it. What, are, what do you think if you ask your student, okay, what are what is your goal? What do you think you would likely to hear? So I'm used to hearing a lot of vague academic goals. I wanna be smart. I wanna go to college. I wanna get straight A's. I wanna be the best in my class, right? Um, pie in the sky, long-term goals. I wanna be famous. I wanna be a pirate. I wanna be a movie star. I wanna be a rock star, right? And then finally, no goals. I don't know. I don't have any goals. I can't think of any. Why are you asking me, right? And each one of those actually presents a very serious problem. None of those are motivating. And what to me, what's even worse about them is they all contain some self-judgment. I wanna be smart means you're not smart. You know, I wanna be a famous means what's wrong with me? I'm not famous now, right? And no goals, I don't know. To me, that means I don't deserve goals or if I had goals, I wouldn't be able to achieve them. So we cannot rest there. We have to kind of push on that. So I'm going to walk you through our approach to goal setting. I'm going to show you a strategy from our curriculum. And then we'll come back to that motivation piece because I have a lot more to say about that um, based on the questions you guys asked. So here is a very inspirational quote that I saw on Facebook the other day. I can't, so I can't take credit for it, but I thought it was beautiful. And of course it was like up against a beautiful beachscape with like driftwood, but I just kind of copied it down and, and gave you the author. So a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. A plan backed by action makes your dreams come true. So while that is very schmaltzy, it's actually um, dead on. That's what we need to do. We need to take those dreams out of their head where they're using them to beat themselves up. We need to write them down. We need to make them explicit. And that's gonna help students uh, achieve the goals instead of just being down on themselves. So this comes from the SMARTS curriculum. Uh, this is one of our goal setting strategies it's called can-do goals. So you may have heard of SMART goals, but we like can-do goals and they're better and I will tell you why. The way we actually start the lesson though is by differentiating short-term goals versus long-term goals. It's really important to help students see that because remember those students who are saying, I wanna be a rock star, you know, that's a long-term goal. I need them to also be able to identify the goals that are more immediate if they're gonna be motivated. So we play just a very simple, you know, game talking about, okay, short-term goals and long-term goals is two different kinds of goals. Sometimes we have them guess, you know, what do you think this is? What do you think that is? Because the point is 
that uh, a long-term goal, such as getting a B plus for the semester in science, is made up of short-term goals, such as study 30 minutes, go to my teacher I don't understand, organize class notes. Another great way of doing this, by the way, is modeling the goal for yourself. Uh, is saying, you know, I had a goal of going to grad school, and so here's what I did. Or one time in college, I had to write a 15-page paper, 20-page paper. And you say that, and the kids are like, oh my god, what did you do? And you explain how you broke it down. So we can model the fact that long-term goals are um, made of short-term goals. And then we get into the acronym itself. So can-do goal, to be a can-do goal, to be a good goal, it has to be clear, appropriate, numerical, and doable with obstacles considered, right? So by taking our students' goals and walking them through this strategy, we end up with something that looks a lot more like that, you know, Facebook quote I showed you before, right? So let's take a look at an example. So here's a student who says, I want to be a good student. And remember, that has a lot of um, self-judgment and it's very vague. They're never going to be able to say, oh, yes, I was a good student. They're relying on this kind of vague internal feeling of goodness. And we can't count on that. So we're going to say, you need to be more clear. Hi, everybody. Uh, so sorry to uh, have lost you. I, you know, that's the thing about goal setting. You got you to keep yourself flexible. Let me just catch back up to where when I'm, and we were kind of going through the steps of an example uh, for how to make a good goal can do, right? So we said that student said, okay, I want to be smart. And we said that is not uh, accurate. You know, that is not clear. What does it mean to be a good student? So we asked them to be more clear about what we're asking them to do. So then they say, I want to uh, get A's and B's. And we're like, all right, that is clear. I could, I could see that when that was happening. But the next question we have to ask ourselves is, is it appropriate? If that's a student who is maybe getting C's or worse, then saying get A's and B's is really kind of a, a high bar for them in the short term right? Not to say you'll never get A's, but to say, let's set a goal that's appropriately challenging. I had a student who was not turning in pretty much all of his homework. And I asked him what his goal was. And he said, I want to turn in all my homework. And I said, let's set a goal for ourselves that is hard, but has some wiggle room. How about baby steps? And so when he presented his goal to his parents, which was, you know, turn in all the homework, only four missing per week. And, you know, the dad was not happy with that. And he said, Dad, give me some baby steps. Um, if I can do this, it will be some progress. And he did, and it was great. Um, next up is to make it numerical. Once again, we have to kind of get goals out of here and make them uh, something we can assess if we're doing it or not. I don't want it to be about, oh, you know, I feel like I'm achieving it or I feel like I'm not. I need to be able to measure it. So the easiest way to measure a goal is to, you could use grades, but also you can use a time frame. Um, you can also use a frequency, right? I have students who say, you know, I need, they need to uh, participate more in class to, to do better. So they say, I'm going to raise my hand, you know, twice a day. And I'm going to put two stickers on my notebook to remind myself of that. Or I'm going to clean out my backpack, uh, you know, once a month, right? So setting a uh, time frame on it can help us check in and see, are we achieving this goal or do we need to adjust it? Um, every goal needs to be broken down into steps. I like three. I think three is a pretty nice number. Um, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, three. It could be four. It could be five. For younger students, it could be two. But by breaking steps down, we ensure that they're using strategic thinking. You know, if the goal to do better in a class is just work hard, that's not very strategic because I don't really know what the steps are. I don't really know how they're going to accomplish that. So instead, I'm going to work with them to come up with the steps that will help them get there, right? So for this student um, who said they're going to in, in, improve their math test, we're going to work with them to think about what are the steps? What are the steps to achieving that? All right. Oh, I forgot that we had this animated, yes. So if the student who's going to improve it, oh, and then my favorite one, obstacles. So I told you that can-do goals are better than SMART goals, and this is why. 
Um, and no offense to smart goals, they're great too. And we're the smarts program. So, you know, we can't say we hate them, but can do goals are better because we assume there's going to be an obstacle. Um, let's just say anytime we're setting a goal, let's just assume something could go wrong. And that takes the sting out of it when it does go wrong. You're like, yep, I knew this was going to happen, right? So Elizabeth and I actually had a secret plan for what would happen if I got disconnected, that she would text me. And she did text me because I was still talking like a crazy person. So that was a pretty good um, backup plan, Elizabeth. Thank you very much for that. So what you do is you identify the obstacles. Sorry, the formatting got a little funny when I uploaded it. We identify three obstacles for each step. So this kid says, what if I leave my notes at home? What if I get busy and I don't have time to review? What if I can't do my homework because I don't understand it? And you use those obstacles to brainstorm solutions. Oh, sorry, the, that also kind of got lost in the formatting. So if we go back, let me just go back to those obstacles. So at home, we can say, all right, then you can email it your friend. Or if you didn't, if you got busy with your other work and you didn't review your flashcards, then you can owe yourself that time at a different state, uh, different date. If you can't understand your homework, you can't do your homework because you don't understand it, you can meet with the teacher. And spelling those things out concretely will help because in the heat of the moment, the kid's going to be like, that's it, I've lost my goal, it's all over. But if it's built into the goal that there's that flexibility, they're going to be much better at achieving those goals. Uh, one thing I mentioned earlier, and I was a big fan of it, you can model your own can-do goals. When I first started the SMARTS program, we were doing like a mentoring thing where I had a middle school student that I was mentoring and we were doing strategies together. And I would do my own can-do goals. And I did one around exercise, a professional goal, and I think a social goal. And I actually was able to keep those goals and we were able to check in with each other and talk about what was working and what wasn't. And it felt really good to share that. Um, we've also done some goal setting where the kids share their goal with the class and they all give each other suggestions. And that is really powerful because it creates a network of support and it makes the goal uh, more useful. So I see that I'm a little frozen, which is unfortunate. I mean, it is very cold here, but can people still hear me? All right, people can still hear me. Elizabeth is telling me that. I'm assuming the internet will catch up. I hope I'm not making like a really weird face while I'm frozen, but you know, let's keep going. Um, so now we're gonna move into that part about motivation, okay? Because when we opened up this webinar to people to get tickets and we said we're talking about goal setting, the questions flooded in. My students don't have goals. My students feel very disconnected. So let me share a really powerful quote from one of my own students. Okay, and you're not, you might not believe this is a real quote. So let's see uh, if you believe it. You guys believe that? Can you believe a 16 year old student said that to me, but I don't care. And he said it, you have to kind of read it in kind of a disaffected Boston accent, which I'm not gonna do, I can't do it. Uh, so here I am, I've got all these great strategies. I, you know, we have a pretty good relationship. You know, I really kind of spent time on that. And I'm like, we got to get this. We got to get rid of this F in English. We got to get rid of this F in science. What are we going to do? It's like, I don't care. I don't care. And that's a very, it's so hard to hear that as an educator. And of course, you know, in the short term, I'm like, well, maybe what can I do to just help him get over that hump? But we have to sell, somehow help him connect because he's 16. You know, in two years, he's going to be an adult. And then, you know, he's off into a world where he needs to be able to count on his motivation. So we need to kind of help him connect it. So let me just share a few ideas around that and let's see uh, what that kind of does for you guys. So one thing I like to do is just talk about procrastination. A lot of times when students say, I don't care, we're gonna see the procrastination. We're gonna see that very visible uh, distancing from the work. So I have a great, this is a great webinar. I encourage you to check it out. It's Tim Urban, TED Talk, Inside the Mind of a Master Procrastinator. And it really is very funny, but also kind of helps normalize procrastination. Just like organization, the only time they hear the word procrastination is when someone is getting down on their case. Oh, why don't you, uh, why didn't you get your homework done? Why didn't you do da da da? So procrastination can be a serious problem, but we all do it, right? So I think showing a video like this or sharing your own stories can really help to take some of the judgment out of the conversation that you're about to have around procrastination.
And then after you do it, you can say, okay, so we all procrastinate. So I know you procrastinated on that paper last night. So tell me, why did you procrastinate? Tell me, why did you procrastinate the other night? And this is another direct quote, and I've heard this from a lot of students. So get ready, because I was lazy, okay? Um, I just felt lazy. I guess I'm just lazy. I'm being lazy today. And that's something that we cannot accept. I tell my students, lazy is a four letter word. You cannot say that in my office, right? And here's what I tell them. Uh, laziness is a myth. It's not real. Laziness, we cannot accept laziness. And I'm stealing that line from, you know, Mel Levine, the myth of laziness. So I didn't come up with it, but I love it. Uh, you say that line to your kids and they'll be like, or whatever, you know, however teenagers react like, Ugh. you know, um, because we're so used to relying on it. But laziness, if we just accepted that, that is, we're not getting to the root of it. Um, I was like, you know, behavior as a communication. If people are being quote unquote lazy, they're trying to tell us something. And we need to dig underneath that and figure out what that message is. And it's the same thing with those kids who say, I don't care, I don't have goals. They're trying to tell us something. Because I strongly believe, and I hope that you do too, that all students have mastery motivation. All students want to do well. I, I put a monkey up here because I like to tell my students a little story about the psychologist Harlow, who was famous for his monkey experiments, where he put a little puzzle in the cage with the monkeys. And he said, I'm going to bribe those monkeys to solve that puzzle. And I'll come back the next morning and I'll start bribing them. So he comes back the next day and they're all already solving the puzzle because our brains and monkeys' brains are problem-solving machines. We want to solve any problem that's in front of us. We want to do well at the things we're being asked to do, right? I also love this line from um, The Explosive Child or, or Think Kids uh, or Collaborative Problem Solving, I think it's called. Um, kids do well if they can. At, the, at our base, we all want to be good at the things we're being asked to do, right? Um, so when we talk about motivation, Right. So, this is, but we know there's some kids who don't have motivation. So we talk about motivation. There's two kinds: extrinsic, which means do it or else. I will give you five dollars if you do it. I'll take away your, you know, phone if you don't do it. Right. That is being extrinsically motivated. And then intrinsic. I'm doing it because I care and I want to be good at this thing. Right. So it's always kind of an interesting question to ask: which type of motivation is better? And I think even as educators, we would be like, oh, it's totally intrinsic. Intrinsic is the best. But the truth is that that's a sneaky question. Um, they are actually both better. They're both important. Uh, extrinsic motivation becomes intrinsic motivation, right? My favorite example for this, and I'm sorry it's kind of gross, is uh, potty training. So if you have young children, at first, they do not want to stop using diapers. Why would they? Their life is great. They can do whatever they want, and then someone will come and wipe their butt. Um, so at first, it's really extrinsically motivated. OK, if you go on the potty, I'll give you a fire truck. If you go on the potty, your friends will know that you're a big boy or big girl. Right? We're doing it extrinsically. And gradually, they become more intrinsically motivated to you know, not not use a diaper, and then all of a sudden it becomes automated, right? So most motivation, whether it's going to the bathroom or learning to play the piano or going to college, started off extrinsic and it becomes intrinsic. So we don't need to, we need to rely on both, but what is the process? What are the factors that allow someone to go from being a motivated or extrinsically motivated to intrinsically motivated? Well, um, so Desi and Ryan, to brilliant psychologists have identified three types of um, beliefs that lead to the development of intrinsic motivation, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Autonomy is the belief that you're your own boss, that you have that logos of self-control. It does not mean you do things by yourself. It drives me crazy working with college students who say, I don't want help from my professor. I don't want help from a tutor. I want to do everything on my own. That is not how humans were designed. We're social creatures. You can have that control to reach out and say, yes, I want help for this. No, I don't want help from that. But we need to work with other people in a way that promotes the student to say, I am my own boss. Okay, 
Uh, competence is the belief that you'll be good at the task you're being asked to do. So if I put a calculus, like if I had calculus in front of me, I would not have very strong ca uh, competence beliefs because I don't know how to do calculus. But if you put, you know, a, a teenager who needs to clean out their backpack in front of me, oh yes, I would feel very competent that I could have that conversation with them. And relatedness. Relatedness is the desire to interact and connect. And this is a very important one to pay attention to because it's if we ask students to do something that challenges their beliefs about who they see themselves in connection to other people, then they're going to be very demotivated to do it. Um, however, if we connect them in a way that's positive to relationships in their life that are supportive, that's going to foster motivation. So I already kind of made this point, but if these three needs are not met, um, then the motivation is what's going to suffer. So that student of mine who said, you know, I don't care, that's, that was a Boston accent, I don't care, um, he really felt that all of those were suffering, right? Um, he wasn't allowed to make his own decisions. He wouldn't be good at the work even if he tried it. And he, his teachers hated him, right? So each one of those is attacking his motivation. He feels like he has motivation, no motivation and he can't describe any goals related to his schoolwork. However, if we can figure out a way to get these three needs met, the student is going to have the opportunities to develop a more intrinsic um, type of motivation. So just looking at each one of those areas, you can think of strategies that address them discreetly. If a student is struggling with autonomy, we just have to brainstorm about ways they can actually make choices. They may not be allowed to choose if they do their homework or not, but we can help them see that they can decide when and where they do it. Um, we can help them see different strategies for doing it, you know, exposing students to maybe say speech to text or, you know, uh, a different I honestly, like one time I just gave a student a really nice pen that I had and he loved doing it. Having that choice for how to do his work felt more motivating to him. Um, aligning unappealing tasks with the goals that are important to you. That student who said he really wasn't motivated was really into the military, into the Marines. So I asked him, what would a Marine do um, when presented with a test? So let's put on kind of our Marine mentality and power through this thing. And now, of course, the opportunity to identify personally meaningful rewards. That same student um, who was very demotivated by school, when we looked at some military colleges, colleges where you could be an ROTC and go to university, he was a lot more interested in his grades at that moment. Um, when we're dealing with competence, we can basically just help students come up with strategies that will help them believe they can be successful. Identifying where exactly the challenge is, providing strategies to bypass or minimize those challenges, maybe a tutor, some sort of app or something like that that will help them check their answers, um, or you know, just communicating with the teacher very clearly where the challenge is and seeing if there's a way to uh, accommodate for that. And then also helping them develop an accurate perception of the challenge. A lot of times students will come to us saying, I can't do it. And that's anytime it's black and white like that, we know that's not quite right. So digging into it and saying, well, this part's been very hard for you, but this part's actually going pretty well, will help them build those competence beliefs. Um, and finally, relatedness. Students who, you know, are struggling with motivation may need some opportunities to connect to relationships that support them. Looking for relationships in their lives that help, whether that's friends or whether that is, um, you know, teachers or allies in the school uh, can be very helpful. Um, spending time talking about empathy, especially empathy towards others and yourself, can heal some of that negativity and helping them kind of get closer to their teachers or people who they think hate them might actually help with motivation a lot. And then helping them kind of define who they see themselves as and who they want to see themselves as can be very valuable. So if you're looking for a strategy to kind of pull all this together, sometimes I just take this wheel, this pie chart, and I go with my students and I say, um, let's think about something that is really hard for you that you're not motivated to do. And we write down the beliefs in each one of those pie charts, right? Then I flip it over. I'm very sneaky. I flip it over and there's another pie chart. And we do it again with something that they're actually really good at. So maybe school is hard, but sports go well. Or school goes well, but socializing is hard. And if we look at this, the beliefs from one domain to another, it might help give you a clue that um, there are strategies that you can 
carry across. It also might help them see that things aren't quite as hopeless. It can help kind of contextualize some of those beliefs that may be getting in their way. Now I do wanna, I hope I'm not making this sound too easy. Helping students get in touch with their motivation is a big task and it's a lifelong task as well. But I think instead of kind of just hoping that students will find motivation, sharing some of the research around motivation with them and asking them questions that are specific and targeted can help them begin that process. And I think you can align strategy, just like we align strategies for academic tasks, we can align strategies to areas of motivation where students are suffering. Um, so I'm so sorry, I know the tech was a little bit of an issue, but as long as you guys can hear me, I did save about 10 minutes for questions. So if people have questions, I assume they're kind of typing them. Oh, I see. I see no funny faces. That's good. I'm glad I wasn't uh, making a funny face. If you have a question that you want to kind of propose, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, so go ahead and type that in now. If Elizabeth, I don't know if you saw any that I missed while I was um, blathering on and on but we have a little time for some of those before we sign off. Um, for those of you who are struggling with audio, we will um, put the recording back up. And if the recording is terrible, we will just record it you know, offline in a perfect, you know, no internet zone and we'll upload that. So you know, hopefully that will uh, accommodate that piece. And I apologize again for those tech problems. Does anyone have any questions that they want to share with us while we're here together? All right, I think I see one. Oh, someone wants to know if we have a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, yes, we can do that as well. Yeah, we can get you the PowerPoint too. All right, so I'm just gonna wait, you know, maybe two more minutes and see if any questions roll in. I feel like I did kind of create some issues with the tech stuff, which I am sorry about that. Um, oh yeah, I see, so I do see a question about um, if you have, so we can provide all the tools and techniques to cope with executive function deficit, but how do we make sure they remember to use those tools? Well, I have two things to say about that. Um, one is, the opportunities for reflection. If you teach an executive function strategy, you have to go back and ask them, was that valuable for you? Did you like it? Um, I work with a lot of kind of surly, you know, teenagers who are gonna say, no, I hated it. And that's fine, but I'm gonna keep asking them, well, tell me, what was it you didn't like about it? What, you know, uh, did it take too much time? Uh, did it feel like extra work? Um, does it not match your learning style? And by keeping to ask that, I'm kind of building that self-awareness piece so that one of these times when I ask them, they're gonna say, no, I don't like that strategy. I like this strategy instead. And that's how I know that those um, skills are landing. The other piece though, is that you do need to kind of have them on hand. If you teach it one time, um, it probably will not, you know, work just in that one time. You need to go back to it. So I teach a strategy about using a planner. Every time I see them, I'm like, let's get out our planners. Let's get out our planners. Let's get out our planners. It needs to be part of, part of life. Um, I see another great question about, are you seeing kids who are unmotivated to do score because of video games? That is so interesting. Video games are really a double whammy. Um, first of all, they're a perfect distraction, but also if you think about it, they are super motivating. They're basically like a small challenge that you can achieve and out. win. So why would I study for a calculus test when I can play a video game for 15 minutes and get that endorphin rush of winning? Um, so video games are very motivating in themselves and they're very demotivating in other areas of life. I definitely recommend kind of coming up with a digital diet. I'm not saying the kids should not play video games. I played them when I was younger, but there really should be a balanced approach to them. They, I don't think that most of my students um, benefit from unrestricted access to video games. Um, I see a student asking about the typical number of sessions I have with a student. So it, it depends. I, I see my students about once a week. Um, and for some students who have a very kind of 
discreet and focused. I want to do better on writing papers. I want to do better on using my planner. Um, that might be six to eight sessions. For students who are really kind of struggling or who are looking for um, maybe kind of a broader approach, more of a coaching model, I'll see them throughout most of the academic year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me just see if I have any other questions to respond to. And so once again, I do want to apologize for the issues um, with audio and whatnot. I think what we'll have to do is Elizabeth and I will find a way to, well, we'll view the recording from this. Maybe it maybe it was a little stronger um, on my end. And if not, we'll certainly make the PowerPoint available, the PDF of the PowerPoint, and then we'll figure out um, if there's a way to get you a clear um, audio as well. I do see someone asking if there's a certificate for attending. Um, that is something that we can create. Um, so I'm putting, that's my email up there. If you email me and you need a certificate, let me know and we will get it um, back to you. You know, I know we have Thanksgiving coming up, but we'll get it to you as uh, quickly as we can. All right, so why don't we sign off there? Thank you guys so much for spending an hour with us talking about the very important concepts of executive function and goal setting. Uh, feel free to reach out with your questions, comments, or concerns. Uh, we are very happy to hear from you. We love to hear your questions. We have all sorts of resources on our very many websites that I encourage you to explore. If you ever do come to one of our trainings or use our curriculum, make sure you do say hi, uh, and we really appreciate you spending that time with us today. So uh, thank you very much and hope to hear from you.